This module will discuss the area of feed additives. This is Mike Hutchins again from the University of Illinois, and we'll be discussing a fairly controversial area on feed additives, kind of the, the half glass type topic. Uh, you'll either see uh, feed additives as being half full or half empty, either being, being somewhat optimistic or somewhat conservative here. And of course, we have some fairly interesting, expensive additives that we can put in the feeding program. Back in 1993, the University of Kentucky, Missouri surveyed dairymen producing 20,000 pound herd averages or higher and asked them a series of questions. And one was, which additives were you using? And you can see in 1983, about 70% were using bicarb. Magox was not in the survey. 17% yeast culture, niacin 16%. And zinc methionine uh, was not in the survey at that point. Then in 1992, Ellen Jordan from Texas A&M went back and surveyed farmers that were over 25,000 pound rolling herd averages. In fact, the average was close to 27,000 pounds of milk. And she asked again a similar series of questions and one was additives. And now you can see again some changes. What's interesting, you can see sodium bicarb stays fairly constant at about three quarters of the U.S. dairy farmers that have these high level herds are using sodium bicarb. Yeast culture was surprising. Uh, uh, almost a three-fold increase in yeast culture. Niacin did increase but not to near the extent of some of the other additives, and zinc methionine came up to close to 50%. So this data simply says that in high producing herds, we tend to see a fairly good acceptance or utilization or, or targeting of feed additives. In the 1983 survey, they also asked which farmers used none of these additives, and 10% of the farmers used none of these additives and still had 20 plus thousand pounds of milk, which also says you don't have to use additives to achieve high levels of milk yield. We're going to evaluate feed additives using what we call the four R's. The first R is what we call response. And before a dairy farmer, a veterinarian, nutritionist, a student uses a additive, they should ask, what do we expect that additive to achieve? We're just not going to throw it in there and say, gee, let's watch the cows. The responses that you could expect would be milk yield or milk component changes. A greater dry matter or feed intake could be the response you're trying to achieve. Those two probably go hand in hand, by the way. Improved rumen digestion somehow change the rumen dynamics. If it's a heifer, like with an ionophore, a growth both response could be occurring, better feed efficiency, better feed conversion, a reduced stress, for example, with uh, some of our additives like ketosis control, improved health, and the list could go on and on. But the point is you should know before you put it in what you are going to watch for to evaluate, in fact, what response will be occurring. The second R we will discuss is returns. That's basically the question, can you make a buck when you put this additive in the feeding program? What we like to look at is something we call cost-benefit ratio or ratio cost-benefit, depending how you want to flip that ratio around. It simply says, if it costs me six cents to put bicarb in the ration, what return can I expect to get? In other words, we can you get 12 cents back, 18 cents back, or no cents back? We like to see a benefit to cost or cost-benefit ratio of two to one, meaning I get $2 back for every $1 I invest in a feed additive. And that's because some cows won't respond. You can see our target cows, our second bullet item says, well, what are the responding cows? A good example would be niacin. Our target cows are the close-up dry cows, the fresh cows, cows the first 70, 80 days into lactation when they are at risk for ketosis. Feeding niacin to cows that are pregnant out 250 days will not give you much response. So that means you're going to have to be sure that the responding cows at least cover up for the other cows that are not going to respond out there. And that's why we like this ratio two to one. The third one will be non-economic returns. What happens if we reduce stress? What if we have better feet and legs? That's a very difficult one to look at because we don't sell that in the bulk tank. But still, that's important in the herd dynamics. And you as a user of the additive has to determine that while it may not be a dollars and cents return, there is some other non-economic factor that is value out there on the farm. Another way to get a handle on this economic response is this chart, which simply looks on the left side, what is the cost of the additive per cow per day? For example, zinc methionine would be two cents to four cents. Buffer would be six cents per day. Methionine would be 10 cents a day. And beta carotene would be 30 cents a day. Go across the chart, this is milk price. So let's say the price of milk today is $12 per hundred weight. It says that if I feed sodium bicarb at six cents per cow per day to all my cows, every cow must give me a half a pound milk increase if that is the response we're going to use to justify the cost of the bicarb. So if some cows respond three or four pounds a day and other cows respond not at all, if we at least average a half a pound, it is at least a break-even point and we recovered our investment. The third R will be research. 
basically the answer is, well, does it really work? And when we look at research studies, we try to look at those studies that are controlled, which means that when we look at a research study at a university, or if it's on an experimental farm, or if it's on your farm, part of the cows get it, and part of the cows don't get it, and we can compare to see, in fact, if the response was due to heat stress, or the response was due to the additive, or because you got better quality haylage. So it's got to be a controlled study so we can compare apples to apples. Number two, it should be unbiased. And that's one of the advantages of using land-grant college research and that theoretically the researcher has no vested interest if it works or not. Whereas a private company does the study, obviously they would like to have the research work because they're going to try to market that product and make money on it. The third one will be once that data has been done, it is unbiased, the question is, is the response we see statistically important? It says, is it repeatable? And so you'll see studies that says, well, uh, we have a 95% confidence that this really did happen. And so in some studies, a small increase of one or two pounds of milk will be statistically significant because every cow had a one or two pound response. We have studies here at the University of Illinois in which we saw a response that averaged six pounds of milk but yet the computer said it wasn't real. And what happened there is some of the cows gave us 10 or 12 pound milk response. Another group of cows gave no response at all. And the computer said there's so much variation, we're not really sure that that is an actual response. And that's what we mean by statistical. So when you look at an additive, you should ask the company that's selling the product is, where's the research? Who did it? how it was done, how many cows, and was there a statistical response? So when I come to my farm, I've got a 95% chance that I can repeat that study on my farm. Now, let's talk about research and making a mistake. Here is an interesting study put together by the Pennsylvania workers when they took 18 different research studies that reported in the Journal of Animal Science and Dairy Science that used sodium bicarbonate, a buffer. The inclusion rate was 0.75% of the ration dry matter, which is the recommended level. And the value for the milk was 13 cents a hundredweight or 13 cents a pound. And feed cost was 7 cents per pound of dry matter. And the question is now, what if we make a mistake using it or not using it? There are two types of mistake the dairy farmer, the nutritionist, Mike Hutchins, could make. The first error is what they call a type 1 error, and that is that we feed sodium bicarb and we get no response at all. Based on those cost input items, that would have resulted in a 4 cent loss per error under this type 1 error. The other error is that, gee, if I would have fed it, there was a response, but I decided because I was so tight, I wasn't going to feed it. And that would have cost, based on those 18 studies, that error would cost you 30 cents per day. And so as a dairy farmer nutritionist, you say, what is my risk? And so with sodium bicarb, there is a greater risk by not using it than by using it and not getting a response at all. And that differential, you can see, is almost a seven-fold difference. Very few additives have this type of analysis because it takes a great deal of research, but it shows as a dairy farmer, the type of decision you have to make because not all cows are going to respond to a given additive. The fourth R we'll discuss, and that is results. It simply says you can look at the University of Illinois or you can look at Church and Dwight and see their data, but the bottom line is, does the bicarb, does the additive work on my farm? And so you have to ask yourself, well, what can I look at to determine if I'm getting my 6 or 8 or 10 cents back? And so do you have some type of milk recording records? That could be DHI, that could be Dairy Comp 305, but there's some way, if it's a milk response, can I capture it? A component response, you could get that from the creamery per chance. Uh, some of it may be a health response. So if it's reproduction, what kind of charts do I have that I can track reproductive performance, somatic cell count change, what type of a heifer growth curve have I established to determine, in fact, if I change it around? If you cannot measure the result, then you are missing one of the four R's, and we have to ask, should you be messing around with that additive? Well, certainly as milk prices fluctuate, and we see nowadays uh, milk prices changing 2 3 $4 per hundredweight, the question is, well, what is the economics? Where do I draw the line? When do I, do I decide to put a given additive in? When do I take it out? What we have attempted to do is put together a list of additives which is contained on this media so that you can look at. We have well over 20 different additives categorized by these six classifications. The first one is function. It'll say, okay, if I'm going to feed beta-keratin, this is the function that we may anticipate seeing. 
So, and in many cases, additives will have three or four different functions. For example, if we pick on uh, anhydrous ammonia, it may stabilize the silage. It, be, it may be a mold inhibitor. It may be a source of, of nitrogen. So there's a lot of different functions these additives may carry. And the question is, are you using it for the right function? The second one will be the level. In other words, that's key when we use additives. Do you put enough in to get the bang for the buck? In other words, if you feed sodium bicarb, you've got to be somewhere around that 200 gram level. If you put in 10 grams, you might as well spit in the ration because you're going to have the same effect. So level is critical. And make sure you don't cheat. You can't cheat on most of these additives. On this table, you'll see a listing of cost. and It'll say, well, this additive will cost you six cents per cow per day, $2 per ton to put a silage inoculant in. So it'll give you what a typical cost would be to put that additive in. Number four, on about half of the additives, additives, you will find a benefit to cost ratio based on the research results published in various research journals. And so it'll say, for example, for sodium bicarb, it might say a benefit to cost ratio of 6 to 1. For an ionophore like Bovateca rumenza, it's 8 to 1 to 10 to 1. Now, some of them do not have that and it will be listed as not available. It simply means we could not find refereed results that we could extract and interpolate an economic cost-benefit ratio to it. Number five will be strategy. In other words, when should you use it? When it's 90 degrees out, when a calf has coccidiosis. It'll tell you when would be the best time to use this product, and it could be used for several different strategies. And then number six will be status. It says, what do we recommend with this additive? If you look at this reference paper on the module, you'll see four different recommendations. And these recommendations are current for when the module was made. So if you listed this module in the year 2001, be careful. Some of these recommendations could go back and forth. The four categories are, one, recommended. It says, yes, we feel it has satisfied the four R's, and you should use it as needed. Number two, classification could be experimental. It says, gee, this stuff, this additive looks really interesting, but we need more research on it. Enzymes would be a good example today that we need more information on them before we can recommend them. The third one would be evaluative. It says, well, there's lots of research out there, but gosh, it's so variable. We're not really sure if it's always going to work on your farm. So if you are going to use it, go in with open eyes and determine if, in fact, on your farm you're going to see the response. And the fourth category says not recommended. It means at this point it's missing one of the four R's, and in most cases that is an economic response. It means we, we're, we're paying a dime and getting a nickel back, or we're not sure you can get a good economic response on it. Well, this completes the module on feed additives. As we said, on this module, you should be able to find a paper that lists well over 20 common additives that are available here in the U.S. that you could look and explore and answer these six basic questions we had. So have a good time. Look at these various additives. Be a smart buyer and have a good day.